Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning for the May edition of our Pearson Lunch and Learn series. Our featured speaker today is Bina Desai. She's the head of programs at the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center, and we're excited to have her with us this morning. Uh, first, we'll hear from Wasa Ingo. He's a Pearson Fellow and an MPP student at the Harris School. He's going to provide our speaker introduction this morning. And later in the program, we'll open up for Q&A. And we ask that the first few questions come from our students. We'll invite, we invite you to submit your questions in the Q&A feature. And we'll give you a couple of different options on how you can ask your question. Uh, we can have the moderator ask on your behalf. You can ask with the audio only feature or ask live on camera. If you choose any of the last two options, I will need to give you permissions. So please expect a slight delay. Thank you guys again for joining us. I hope you enjoyed today's programming and I'll turn it over to Vassal. Thank you and welcome everyone. I am Vassal Ingle, a graduating MPP student at the Harris School of Public Policy and a second year Pearson Fellow. It's my great pleasure to introduce Bina Desai, to you today, who works as the head of programs at the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center. In this role, she oversees the organization's program work, including global monitoring and reporting, the development of the flagship global report on internal displacement, the thematic research agenda, and data and risk analysis. Forced migration is a critical component in understanding the consequences of conflict. In fact, it's what brought me here to the Pearson Institute. After an early career focused on migration in Sudan, I was eager to better understand the root causes of many of the conflicts driving migration across East Africa. While much deserved attention is often given to refugees, there are many people forced to flee conflict and disaster who never get to cross their country's border. Understanding internal displacement is a critical step towards peace and sustainable development. And that's why I'm excited to hear from Dr. Desai on the important ways that data and analysis can be used to seek solutions for internally displaced persons. I'm excited to announce Dr. Desai today because when I looked at her impressive resume, I noticed that she too worked for the German Ministry for Development, which is where I started off as well before coming to use Chicago. She has also worked for the Aga Khan Development Network, Christian Aid, DFID, and the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, which is something that I can't say about myself. In fact, Dr. Desai served as a UN policy analyst from 2010 until 2017 co-authoring and leading the production of the UN's Global Assessment Reports on Disaster Risk Reduction. Bina holds a PhD in Social Anthropology from the School of Oriental and African Studies in London and a Master of Science in Sociology and Economics. Her main research interests are the relationship between inequality and economic growth, climate change impacts and disaster risk reduction, and urban change and displacement, which she will tell us more about today. That said, it's my great pleasure to announce Bina Desai now, and I'm looking forward to an interesting discussion ahead. Good to have you with us today, Bina. Thank you so much, Russell, and upfront, thank you to Alex for the invitation. Uh, I'm delighted to be here, and thank you very much for Kelly for really excellent uh, preparations for this series. I'm very impressed by uh, the professionalism that you've all been displaying in the run-up to this. Um, so I was also really delighted to look at and see um, some of the previous speakers that you've had in this series, um, and particularly the focus on data that uh, you, you have been discussing in, in the series, um, and the use of data, as Russell, you said, um, for uh, policy, but also programming and more effective action on the ground. Um, but I've also seen from the responses of the participants today uh, that kindly filled in the little mini questionnaire that uh, the majority are not really familiar with IDMC, um, with our work, and doesn't use our data. So I think this is a great opportunity, of course, uh, for me and for us to present our work, um, but also to discuss maybe in the Q&A a little bit on how we can improve our work so that our data can be used more for the good research and, uh, that you do. So therefore, I decided to present uh, briefly um, in three parts. I will start off actually explaining a little bit of who we are, uh, what we do and how we do it. Um, then I will give a little bit of an overview of internal displacement, uh, the scale of it, some of the key issues, uh, some of the key data gaps, and then close off with um, some more positive news in terms of the advances that have been made, but also some next steps and where we see how research can contribute to the uh, upcoming agenda in the coming years. 
So I'll try to keep on uh, in time, but if not, Russell, feel free to also come in and, and, and say uh, that I should wrap up or Alex who will moderate the discussion afterwards. So just kicking off uh, about who we are, um, we were set up in 1998 um, with a UN mandate, but we're an independent uh, institution. We're a small outfit based in Geneva, of around 35 people. Um, and this was really done in the absence of an international agency responsible for the topic of internal displacement. It was very much seen as an issue of national sovereignty and countries uh, didn't want um, an international body really to uh, set the agenda and, and even to monitor the issue. But it was recognized that there was some need of, of data on who's displaced, where they are, and so that at least humanitarian assistance could be provided uh, to these people. And this was very much in the context of conflict at the beginning. So in 1998, these are the countries that um, you know, IDMC started monitoring a conflict displacement in, adding countries over the time, and then from 2008 onwards, also adding disaster displacement, which is what you see here in blue. Um, and, and I'll come to that later, why this is also important for, for uh, we think, for uh, you know, peace uh, studies and also the broader sustainable development agendas. So we're looking at it comprehensively now uh, across context. We see it's a global phenomenon, very much so. We overall generate evidence. We also support capacity of our partners, international actors, UN agencies, but, uh, and, and increasingly countries directly. And we hope to galvanize action. So the left hand pillar that you see here, the generating evidence is what I'll be talking about most today. Um, but and it's also actually been the core of our work for the last 20 years or so. Um, but over the past uh, few years, we've really increased um, on demand by countries and by our partners. Um, also our outreach and our offer in terms of the service data services, uh, research services to at the national level. Um, and also we convene dialogues very much as you do um, uh, on research. We do that also on uh, promising practices, uh, policies, um, uh, specific thematic areas among countries. I'll come to that later, but I think um, uh, something again for the discussion potentially later, we very much find that what's missing currently from the debate um, or in the dialogue on internal displacement is really the voice of countries that actually have internal displacement, as well as uh, the voices of IDPs themselves. So this is something that we also want to bring um, to, to, the, to the process. But on the evidence part, um, the engine of everything that we do in a sense is our global monitoring. And that was the core mandate that we were set out to do. And this is really about collecting, curating, aggregating, analyzing, and then reporting on all the data that we can get our hands on, on internal displacement. Um, across the triggers, as I said, and different types of context, conflict, disasters, we have here development projects in the slide, but it goes beyond that. It can be you know, displacement in the context of urban change, uh, human rights violations, um, different, uh, different situations. Anything that we, we find reports on, and this is really from, again, UN, media, governments, NGO, local NGOs, uh, international NGOs, but also new technologies such as uh, mo mobile data um, in the case of disasters, but also satellite imagery analysis and other types of, of technologies that we apply to really scrape, in a sense, what's out there um, uh, on internal displacement. We validate it, we organize it, we, we uh, cross-reference, etc. as any good researcher, uh, um, and you all know, therefore, uh, would do what we try to, of course, do is report only on situations where we have multiple sources and can verify to some extent, triangulate and validate. And where we don't, we then have to, you know, we put a caveat on the data and, and explain uh, that, that we have low confidence. More than that, though, also what we uh, uh, do is partner engagement with the organizations on the ground to really understand the context in which we have to uh, grasp, uh, report on the numbers, understand them, address them. Digital knowledge is extremely important. And this is something that is varies the type of partner engagement from context to context. Um, you see here on the right hand side a graph um, of our data sources on disaster displacement. You see that the majority is really from government sources. In the context of conflict, it's very different. As you can imagine, a lot of governments do not report on conflict-related displacement in their countries, and it's UN partners such as UNHCR, OCHA, um, and other uh, more local actors who, who provide the data. 
We have a data uh, displacement data model. I will not bore you with the details, but I just wanted to put it up here because there are two metrics that we report on in our global uh, flagship report that was mentioned already uh, every year and that are quite critical about um, in, in the coming slides and in the, in the next minutes. So the one metric is the new displacement. So that's the left-hand blue arrow there. And this is movements of people, instances where people were forced to flee. Um, and this can be the same person several times. So this is not a person, but it's a movement. And the second is that little family in the middle there, the IDPs uh, themselves. Uh, it's in tech speak, it's called the stock figure, um, but this is really the number of people displaced at and living in displacement at any given point in time. So those two key metrics, uh, please keep in mind when we, we go forward. And this is kind of the global map that we present every year um, in our global report and that we update accordingly. Um, and that again shows it's a global phenomenon. It also shows when we think of new displacements of movements that disasters, blue here again, are um, the majority of these new displacements. Keeping in mind though, that it's very often preemptive evacuations that we also count as displacements and people return. But as we will see later, there's also protracted displacement in the context of disasters. And the other key metric that I showed you there, oh no, first of all, before I go there, actually, um, we have a we also report on the breakdown by hazards. So not just conflict and disasters, um, but also the different types of conflict, um, whether it's armed conflict, it's communal violence, political. Um, I see here that this is still the, because this is data from 2019, and I cannot show you the 2020 data yet. You'll, you'll understand why uh, at the end of this presentation. Um, but this conflict, in a sense, and violence data typology is still our old one, which we've updated and revised. And, and given that you're all experts on the topic, it would be great actually to hear from you what the, uh, the key typologies are that you use when you, when you uh, study conflict and violence. But we also see, again, as I mentioned, most new displacements in the context of disasters and the vast majority of those weather related. So therefore also the role of climate change in these contexts increasing. And here we are with that other key metric that I mentioned. This is the total number of uh, IDPs from conflict and violence at the end of 2019. The 2020 figures uh, I'm not showing, but sadly, it's often the same suspects. And even though some countries like Syria have come up uh, again now many years, but uh, you know over the past years, in a sense, are, are up the list and, and not into the top 10, 20. Um, some others have been there, sadly, since 1998, since we've started comprehensively monitoring the phenomenon, such as Colombia uh, and Nigeria, for example. And for the first time last year, we were also able to move in the context of disasters beyond these new displacements and evacuations to an estim first estimate of the number of people living in displacement after, the, you know, uh, after or resulting from and in the context of disasters. Now, we are sure that this is a vast underestimate, um, but at the same time, we want to be conservative with our figures rather than sensationalist, and therefore we, we prefer to present the figures that we're confident in rather than big numbers. And we're trying to improve the methodology to expand on, on, these, on, on the analysis in the coming years. And why is this important? So why is it important to actually have this stock in both of these metrics? One shows really the, vulnerab the vulnerability, the recurring, the, the ongoing chronic vulnerability of populations, be it in conflict or in disaster settings. Um, and the other, though, is really important to have to, of course, to plan humanitarian assistance, knowing where the people are, how many are there, but also to start assessing the impacts that displacement has on displaced populations, on host communities, on communities or areas of origin, and to really start making the case for adequate levels of investment. And the impacts that both conflict as well as disaster has are multidimensional, very much as poverty, uh, internal displacement um, you know, affects people through directly, of course, the trauma of displacement, but then through various dimensions. Uh, one obvious one that is often you know, considered in humanitarian assistance is through the lo loss of livelihoods or income and therefore potential malnutrition because of lack of access to food. But a less uh, well understood and often under-resourced area is the uh, uh, impact it has, for example, on mental health. 
um, of children if they uh, stop accessing education and their peers, or also of adults um, as their social networks, um, they, they lose their social networks or their cultural uh, context. So the you know, multidimensionality of impacts is important. But what is also important is to start moving into, in a sense, quantifying um, this impact. Um, we've seen that, in, so particularly when it comes, because it's, you know, when it, it's so important for for policy discussions. Basically, I mean, it's not it's not more important uh, in itself. You know, the, what what's the cost uh, uh, of a specific impact? But it is important if you want to enter a dialogue and open up uh, new. Um, also new uh, arenas for conversation. So what we've started to do is actually try and cost it out and have cost estimates of internal displacement in dollar figures. And for 2019 alone, um, and this is just you know based on immediate costs, immediate um, impacts of internal displacement, uh, we estimated that this amounted to around 20 billion US dollars. Uh, again, a considerable underestimate, but just to put a number on the table that would allow us and 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 did also then open the door uh, to have conversations about internal displacement with, for example, finance ministries um, that that before had not actually been uh, that interested. So we did the global estimates, but then to have this conversation at the national level, also national estimates of financial costs for IDPs themselves, which are important again for the humanitarian response, um, based on, on quantitative surveys and qualitative interviews, but also trying to assess the impact on, um, uh, on communities and, and local economies. Um, we developed a unique methodology that we wanted to be it to be transferable across all contexts. Again, it's important that we can consider this in the context of conflict as well as disasters. Um, and also to show the connections often, because as, as I'll discuss a little bit later, we have a lot of contexts where both converge. Um, but also, as I said, make the case for um, more investment and more investment, not just in humanitarian response, but also into more longer term planning um, for displaced populations who will not want to return even when they can, um, and to therefore inform budgetary and, and programmatic planning. And just a few examples, I won't dwell too much on this in the interest of time, um, but from some of our national uh, research and, and, and surveys that we've, uh, and qualitative interviews and, and um, studies that we've conducted in Kenya uh, and Ethiopia, these are examples of the actual cost for IDPs, um, uh, or for host uh, IDPs compared to host communities, as well as then uh, in the context of uh, support provided, what additional costs still were borne by the IDPs. And the last example of Somalia is actually also related to this picture that I have here of this girl. Um, she lives in Banadir camp in, in um, Mogad near Mogadishu in Somalia. And uh, in our study, we found that uh, the, the displaced children in the camp and in the surrounding areas um, actually enjoyed uh, more access to schooling and there were higher enrollment rates of displaced children um, than before uh, having been displaced. But then when we started looking a little bit closer, we saw that this was really the case because the majority of boys uh, were now accessing schooling where because it was they were um, and, and hadn't been uh, in school before because they were part of pastoralist communities who had been displaced by drought and therefore were part of you know during the day had to herd cattle and sheep and weren't actually going to school whereas girls were sometimes going to school and here now in displacement the girls were um, going to school much less than before because of financial uh, the financial impacts that displacement had on the on the families. Boys were then priorities, girls were often um, kept at home and to help with the housework. So this shows us that we need to go beyond, um, yeah, not just the IDP numbers uh, and also just looking at the, the impacts on uh, displaced populations per se, but then dig a bit deeper find more and, and try to access uh, more disaggregated data. There's huge, as I'm sure you, you know, huge gaps um, in data on migrant populations, refugees, uh, IDPs. Um, we do have sit displacement situations where we have quite uh, nicely aggregate disaggregated data, but very often then it's hard to compare those and to arrive at national aggregates or even you know, regional, sub-regional 
uh, aggregates because uh, each data collector uses different uh, breakdowns of age groups. This is one that's commonly used in international statistics, but there's often just you know, under 18 or uh, zero to six. And, and so it's, it's hard to make sense of the data. So in the absence of really solid data across the globe, what we did, we applied um, uh, population um, estimates and, and demographic distribution data from the UNDESA's uh, population division um, and to our displacement data and came up with at least first estimates. Here, the little blue socks or shoes are actually display children displaced in the context of disasters. This is again the orange conflict and displacement as before, just to clarify. And again, why you know do we want to do this? This is because the five, for example, five to 14 years old, you know, each of the age groups will have different needs, different, uh, you will have to plan for differently in the response, but also again in the long term uh, towards durable solutions. So for example, the five to 14 year olds um, um, amounting to almost 13 million internally displaced children are all in uh, of school age. This is, you know, primary school and early secondary school. But then when we look at uh, the humanitarian response plans and, and the budgets available to support education, their education needs, we see, for this is just an example of sub-Saharan Africa, that only 21% of these children who are actually in need of access to schooling in displacement were included in the plans and also uh, funding was secured. So uh, 40, more than 40% were included in the plans, but then no funding secured and another almost 40% didn't actually, weren't actually even accounted for. And I had a really hard time selecting, you know, um, you know, what types of other issues I should flag today, um, given that I only have half an hour or so to talk to you about, you know, quite a, a, a complex issue. And um, and we could we could spend hours, um, you know, touching on and a lot of subtopics. But what I thought would probably be of interest um, to students uh, studying peace building and, and conflict analysis, etc., is something that has been a really growing concern of ours at IDMC over the past years, because we're seeing more and more, as I mentioned earlier, the convergence of drivers of displacement in you know, environmental drivers, disaster as triggering displacement, as well as communal and conflict violence and um, uh, uh, tension, uh, communal tension uh, uh, as drivers, also triggering displacement, sometimes at the same time, sometimes one after the other, creating compound crisis. We have a lot of instances where there are uh, pe uh, people already displaced by conflict, then repeated, di again displaced, onward displaced, secondary and multiple displacements by disaster events, vulnerable IDP camps, uh, vulnerable housing in informal settlements and urban areas, et cetera, et cetera. Yemen is um, an extreme example of a compound crisis, as probably some of you know over the past few years. And then the last year with COVID, it's been another layer of, of uh, complexity onto a country where internally displaced populations have been really, in a sense, moving from pan to fire and back uh, between um, uh, active conflict, areas of active conflict and, and uh, flood, uh, really high uh, flood impacts. Somalia is another example. Uh, Mozambique recently, the northern um, the, the conflict uh, in, in Capo Delgado and northern Mozambique, hitting an area that has been devastated by floods and cyclones repeatedly over the past years and where people have not even been recovering. So this is really um, an area of concern to us also in the context of climate change, um, whereas you know, we know that not all uh, extreme events uh, are related to climate change and, and uh, even less so are all displacement, disaster displacements um, uh, occurring in context of uh, climate change. Um, the, the, the nexus in a sense is growing and this convergence um, and, and undermining of people's resilience and therefore increasing vulnerability is definitely something that we're seeing. And also, of course, the changing of the, uh, the intensity uh, of, of ha natural hazards, the frequency and also uh, seasonal plat patterns, climatic patterns, etc. And therefore, what does that all tell us? Um, it, tells us that we need to get much, much better at understanding displacement risk. And this is something that we've been investing in quite a lot um, uh, over the, since I guess 2016, 17, 
and developed um, on the disaster side again, a unique uh, displacement risk model. Now the challenge will be, how do we expand this thinking and also some of the approaches also to conflict settings and to these settings that I just discussed uh, where these drivers are converging. Now we have a relatively simple looking equation here uh, or formula here about you know, that displacement risks is a function of hazard and the natural hazard, the flood, the exposure, you know, being there in that in that instance, and then the vulnerability of a structure and a physical asset like a house or a person um, uh, who is exposed and that then dis uh, uh, generating either you know, mortality, for example, or economic loss, but also displacement. Um, this is something where, again, there's more advances in the disaster uh, arena, but there's a lot to be learned because what we can do and I saw that you had, um, as I mentioned, I saw that you had ACLID uh, last month, I think, in your series. Uh, we're currently discussing with them to try to see how one could collaborate on actually developing um, at least a top line kind of hotspot um, uh, probabilistic risk model on, on displacement uh, risk also in the context of conflict. It's not as sim simple to model. I shouldn't say simple because even natural hazards aren't simple to model. But um, if we look at, you know, beyond the hazard, then the vulnerability and exposure parts, of course, are in, in many ways, the exposure changes, but the, the, uh, but the people exposed and vulnerable are still the same. So what we can do is we can create you know, global analysis like this, um, where we look at uh, displacement risks or so the number of people likely to be displaced at, in any year. Uh, relative to population by income group and can see where the hotspots are. We can create national risk profiles like we're currently doing in a in a big uh, collaborative program with IOM um, and the platform and disaster displacement and five countries in the Pacific region um, to understand displacement risk in a, at a more granular uh, level and so to, to support planned relocation efforts, for example, to build in climate change scenarios and, and look over time. Again, not as easy, I know, or as straightforward uh, uh, in conflict contexts, but still there's a lot to be learned. And last but not least, having applications such as these that are not just you know, for long-term planning, but also for uh, can be used as early warning. And there's of course been a plethora of approaches of this kind uh, being developed um, over the past years and also tested for conflict settings. And this is definitely something where we believe more work uh, needs to be done. And not just on the kind of modeling quantitative side or using probabilistic models, but feeding them and uh, adding to them the qualitative analysis, the, the, the political context analysis, and, and actually trying to situate then some of these uh, results from early warning models such as these uh, into that uh, analysis. And as I said, and I still have a few minutes, that's great. Um, I want to end not just, you know, I don't want to just describe the challenges and then, you know, how, how we, we try and assess those, um, but also look a little bit at, you know, what the, what the opportunity is here. And we do think that there is a unique opportunity right now um, at the national level as well as in th at the international level uh, and that again in two ways at the national level we've developed um, an internal displacement index and I don't have the time to present that here um, but please have a you know if you google it you'll find it uh, have a look at it and also let us know what you think it's still it's a, still a nascent initiative and and we very much want to continue proving it but in working on this framework and then analysis across countries, what countries have been doing, how they're progressing over time potentially. We've seen a huge potential for an appetite also for change. Of course, there are always the areas of this world and countries where um, there's, you know, there, there's not that much um, uh, promise uh, right now in interacting uh, with uh, governments and national governments in particular, but there are other settings where that's is very much the case and where there's a unique uh, opportunity right now. And this coupled with this opportunity at the global level, you may have heard of the high level panel on internal displacement that the Secretary General has uh, brought into life and that was supposed to finish its work already, but got a bit delayed by uh, COVID, like a, a lot of people um, and processes, and that will present its report at the uh, in autumn this year with some hopefully concrete and, and game-changing recommendations on how to really address internal displacement more comprehensively um, 
uh, not just at national level, but also as a community and, and not just uh, be so uh, reactive in it, but really much more proactive as we go forward and more accountable to those that are displaced. And then finally, a word that I try not to use, but in this case, I thought it's Let's just bring it in the recognition of the nexus. And this is again where the discussion with all of you will be extremely interesting to hear because we feel that inter and see that internal displacement in a sense um, is like a, it, it's just a manifestation of everything that's going wrong uh, in, 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 or, yeah, in many ways, in many situations, and therefore cuts across peace building, disaster risk reduction, um, of course, humanitarian assistance, but also long term development. Um, uh, approaches, and that's, therefore, it's in a sense, it's it's you know, it shows the fault lines of development gone wrong, and this is, uh, and it therefore has the opportunity also to really and joined and you know, where we can find joined up approaches to address it, um, to really show us what a nexus could look like, that is often being talked about in policy circles around development and peace building, and then last but not least, really. Um, what can we contribute from research? So at IDMC, I've shown you a little bit, just a, a selection of the type of work that we do. We have thematic research areas on urban displacement, on the relationship between internal displacement and cross-border movements, on um, slow onset uh, climate change, et cetera. Um, but there's a lot of research out there that we think that we should be linking, using more ourselves, but also linking to and offering our services to. We feel we're very worried about and feel that there are a lot of misconceptions around internal displacement uh, and though they have direct and serious implications for people um, and, and policy and response. Um, you know, often, for example, one example is on disaster displacement being short term and, and, and not protracted. Uh, another one is that, you know, conflict displacement in a sense is just uh, you know, we, we just need to focus on conflict, um, the conflict itself and less so, and, and the displaced populations are in a sense collateral damage. And then once the conflict is resolved, we, we can, they can then return and we bring them back. When, and whereas usually, or in, increasingly in many instances, the preferred option of those displaced is local integration and therefore it becomes a completely different, um, you know, uh, story of uh, the, and, and different process that's required to find durable solutions for them, et cetera, et cetera. So also shortcuts and presenting evidence, you know, through, um, I mentioned our index, but, you know, other uh, that, that we hope is not a shortcut, um, but also some of the indices that um, then create some sensationalist uh, stories of mass migration. And this is then my second point here is rather than buy into these shortcuts in, pre in presenting also sometimes sloppy evidence or ignoring the topic because it's con considered not so relevant for um, research also in high income countries or in Europe, for example, because it doesn't potentially affect directly uh, migration into Europe. Rather than doing either uh, of the two, I really consider it as um, a related and relevant part of your research area, I would hope, and particularly, I mean, in in uh, across Sub-Saharan Africa, as you have seen, the numbers are huge, Central America, um, uh, Asia as well, uh, wherever, you know, you look at uh, conflict studies, then I think internal displacement at least should be considered in Europe as well. We have Ukraine, Azerbaijan, Armenia, etc. And then, of course, use our data is my plea and, and let me know and let us know how we can improve the way that we um, share it, we make it available. Um, or how we can make the case for it uh, in a sense that it's relevant, uh, how it can be made relevant and packaged so that you can use it. And then last but not least, the sharing of promising practices. This is something that is extremely um, important as we've seen. I, I said, I don't wanna end just on, or just focus on the challenges. I also want to look at uh, some of the opportunities that we see. And indeed, this is a huge demand from countries themselves. More and more when we, the, the, uh, the government actors, the UN actors on the ground that we talk to and work with, they, they don't want us to just tell them, you know, this is, and then give them an analysis of the problem or a diagnosis. They do want to, and they also don't want us to give them the therapy, of course, and we wouldn't because we're not in the position to, but they want to know how did country X do it? So if I want to set up an IDP registry to start accounting for uh, my IDP population, then how do I do that? 
Okay, there's Colombia. They have a, an, an excellent one. Can you help me understand the process that they went through? So these types of practices, and I would hope that research and again, migration research, conflict research, um, wherever you come across promising and good practices, do feature them. This is something that, that there's not enough attention on and there's huge demand. And I'll stop here and thank you very much and pass on to Alex. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Desai, for this excellent presentation. We're now going to move into the Q&A portion. So we invite our audience to please submit your questions via the Q&A function in the Zoom window. And when you submit your question, please indicate whether you would like to come on video, to come on audio only, or if you would prefer for me to ask on your behalf. If you do come on video or audio, just please expect a slight delay. Um, so we do have our first question who has indicated um, I should ask on their behalf. So our first question comes from Vasu, who works with the International Foundation for Electoral Systems. He says, we are working specifically on the electoral and political rights of displaced people, both as an inherent right, as well as a mechanism to ensure their voices and interests are heard in policymaking. I'm curious whether or how the data you track includes political participation. You want me to go question by question, I imagine. Um, it doesn't is the short of it, but maybe I'll say a few more words to it. It's an extremely important area and thank you very much for the question. Um, we've had, we've actually had research collaboration with some um, uh, institutes that have been looking into this, uh, where we've tried and featured their work just to get a better sense um, of, you know, what we could be looking out for. But we haven't yet systematically included um, political participation uh, into our own surveys. What we have done in the impacts is in terms of access to um, um, I, I'm not sure whether we call it political space, public space, and there are a few uh, specific examples are given, um, but it doesn't cover, you know, fully um, what what you're referring to here. And it's true, it's there are huge, there are of course very interesting examples um, where the fact where people have been moving within their country and therefore losing their um, uh, right to to vote. Um, in, so national elections shouldn't, in principle, be an issue, but of of course, loss of documentation can can be a barrier, but we have had instances where um, where people have been losing the right uh, to vote in their in the area of origin um, without having the right to vote in the so in local elections, um, and also just participation in public life, which is a huge, of course, part of um, and, and in political life. Sorry, is a huge part of uh, reintegration that that can become. Uh, very much a political issue, um, both in the area of origin as well as in in, in host uh, communities. But it's not something that we can reflect right now in the numbers. Thank you. Um, our next question comes from one of our own faculty affiliates, Kara Ross Camarena. Um, and she is a professor at Loyola. And she asks, as I watch organizations present numbers related to COVID over the past year, I'm often aware that there are incentives to choose big numbers without the context of the denominator. How do you take into account population and other relevant denominators in how you present and relay IDP data? That's an excellent question. Um, and I did show, for example, a displacement risk relative to population, precisely because of that. Um, but also to show which areas and which regions and countries actually potentially have, um, you know, where the impact is much more considerable, even though the numbers may be slower. So it's another area that we've been, I didn't have time to discuss that we're really concerned with and, and putting some effort in is to not have a threshold on uh, where we report. So for example, it doesn't have to be a minimum of 100 people displaced before we actually record and then report on it, but any you know any individuals, because a lot of small scale displacement actually is much more impactful uh, in a negative manner on uh, local populations and can erode development gains um, accumulated over years. But yeah, the 
other side of your question, of course, is again that comes a little bit to my, you know, um, desperation or um, uh, sadness about the sensationalist approaches, and and we ourselves are often also trying not to go into that direction. There's a this the the 46 million uh, of people living in displacement and conflict. I'll be very honest. Not all of those, we're 100% sure, of course, that they're still living in displacement. It's often a very political issue to take them off the books. And we are having kind of, every time we do that, uh, we, ha we have to have conversations with countries or also UN actors who have, um, you know, have good reasons why they want to keep them on there, for various reasons. Um, but we are trying to constantly really review our figures and see where it still makes sense and where it doesn't. Context uh, has and uh, context analysis uh, uh, has a huge role to play. I mean, also in terms of when it's not just location, as we know, that um, determines whether someone is displaced or not, but the conditions that someone lives in. So, if you look at the guiding principles on internal displacement, someone is considered displaced um, if they still suffer. I don't know the exact wording, but something along the lines of they still suffer vulnerabilities related to their displacement. If you look at, and you know, the, I mentioned uh, Somalia in terms of onward displacement risk. I mean, if you look at the people um, um, displaced from by drought, for example, or conflict from rural areas into uh, the suburbs of Mogadishu, um, this informal settlements, and the the people are moving next door to others who are not displaced, um, but who uh, are living in similar conditions. Now. You're saying, you know, we are still considered them displaced after maybe 10 years because they still have vulnerabilities related to the displacement, even though the others also are not better off. It's a tricky, it's a tricky topic. So a very good question. And, and we're trying to apply severe, maybe that's what I should still also mention. What we have, um, what we do is, is um, we try to apply a, what we call a severity assessment to each displacement situation to also, again, complement the numbers, which don't tell us that much. Um, with a bit more analysis. So, for example, the millions of displaced in Syria right now, or the millions displaced in Colombia, they live in very different conditions. So we shouldn't be equating those um, displacement situations. At the same time, we also shouldn't negate those that are living in better conditions, say in Azerbaijan and, or in Ukraine and housing, and those who don't have uh, shelter, um, you know, e each of them has their own needs. Thanks. Thanks. All right, for our next question, we're going to welcome back on Vassal, who will ask his question. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, my question is how um, recognizant or aware data analysts actually are, like when they draw the line between internal displacement versus migration to another country. Like I've always wondered how, how, how useful that very common a distinction actually is, because yeah, like I, I always ask myself if it's if it's more of an like artificial line or if it also captures reality. Because when I think of Ethiopia, for example, where there is like conflict in Tigray, um, some people cross over to Sudan, but others they never get to cross over into um, a neighboring country. So, how difficult would it be in a situation like that to collect and then actually, yeah, divide the evidence into internal displacement versus migration to another country? Yeah, again, excellent question. And it's, it's. Um, I mean, I think two or three things in response to this. I mean, we have a lot of situations, even the one that you mentioned, where it's, it's also mixed migration. You've got refugee flows, you've got migration flows, you've got internal um, migration, external migration, as well as internal displacement and then refugee movements. Of course, the whole distinction initiated in, in a sense, uh, you know, a normative uh, problem and a protection issue. Uh, you know, under the Refugee Convention, everyone who crosses the border and who has is in, uh, you know, persecuted and and risk and in risk of losing their lives, etc. As you all know, is then you know can apply for refugee status and is afforded a certain level of protection. People who stay within their borders, who are they going to apply to? In that sense, you know, that's where in, initially also the there was a, a the need to distinguish you know did they cross a border when it came to you know unhcr lobby uh, advocating for their protection for example vis-a-vis -vis the host country 
but also then the need to understand, okay, how many people are not actually in that position? As you say, they couldn't make it across, but they're still, you know, forced to move. And uh, where's this, who's afford, giving them the support that they require? And, um, and also who is responsible? It's then their own uh, governments, obviously, and their own communities. So in that sense, it's um, it's not always possible, indeed, as you say, to distinguish uh, in a clean manner. It's often rough estimates that we're talking about. But there are important distinctions when it comes to, um, you know, international humanitarian law and, and, and protection issues. There are also distinctions, of course, when it comes to, as I mentioned earlier, you know, longer term planning, because you do want a national government to take ownership of the topic and of the issue and actually show responsibility for their own citizens. And you have to show here are millions of your own citizens not accessing basic services, basic rights, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and in that sense, you don't want to throw them all into one pot because then they can also you know, dispose of that responsibility maybe more easily. Thank you. Our next question comes from one of our students um, and she's asking kind of broadly, how do you measure the gendered aspects of IDP. What specific indicators do you measure, look for regarding women or LGBT plus groups? Um, she has actually a second question in this. Um, how do you compare the role of local NGOs or external parties, the international community, such as UN actors, which do you see as more essential to solving IDP challenges or what role do each of these play? Great, thanks a lot for those questions. The first one, um, as I mentioned, the lack of disaggregated data um, on the age disaggregation, the same as there are not, not as bad, but also similarly there um, uh, when it comes to gender. And if at all, we may have uh, data in displacement situations on men and women, but beyond that, uh, you know, other genders and, and uh, uh, there's very, very little data available, even very, very little anecdotal evidence available. And we did put out last year, was it already a year before, uh, a report uh, that was called Sex Matters. And this was, you know, including also the gender, but also looking at uh, what is actually available in terms of the evidence on displaced populations of different genders um, and also their access to, to then services. And yeah, it is, it is quite fragmented. So again, we're operating on the basis of rough estimates, which doesn't really help that much, right? So, you know, gender distribution, again, if you look at the data available, it is usually not, uh, does not include anything, uh, you know, a, 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 for most countries, it doesn't include anything beyond men and women. So we, it doesn't get us that far. It's a huge gap and it's one that we're at, um, collaborating with relevant groups um, to try and fill. We're a member of the Inclusive Data Charter. I don't know whether you've heard of that. It's part of the Sustainable, uh, sustainable Development Data or for Data for Sustainable Development Groups. It's a huge um, uh, international initiative. And, and within that, there are a number of groups also trying, you know, trying to work towards better data on also you know, disaggregated by uh, disability, et cetera, in the context of the SDGs. Um, and, and also other frameworks and just to, to fill that gap. The second uh, question is super interesting. And it's, a, of course, a very personal assessment. I mean, that and I can't, you know, we don't have enough time to go through the whole kind of range of groups. But I do think it's an important question because I had, I think, on one of the slides in the title, countries in the lead. And I do think that, you know, it, whether we like it or not, national governments themselves are key actor here and low and through that also of course local governments and then the depending on how much space they give to civil society um, also civil society organizations in context in fragile context and context with collapsed states of course other types of actors um, in a sense uh, step in and therefore become the more natural lead um, but in the long term it'll always have to be it'll have to be um, those so national governments plus plus, so um, those representatives um, that are that that are responsible to provide the services to the people. So of course you all work probably also on contexts where this is not a national or even a formally recognized local government, but maybe a, a, a non-state armed group that also provides the services. So then you know that uh, in in these contexts. 
the question is how long term, you know, we, how, how do you want to interact? And, and that's a whole different story. And how long term um, are these types of power dynamics at play in these countries? And when it comes to UN groups, civil society, et cetera, um, and we have a plethora of UN agencies that are somewhat involved in addressing internal displacement. Of course, UNHCR, even though it's the refugee agency, um, in many contexts, it, it runs IDP camps. IOM is a huge player uh, and growing player in, in, uh, in terms of response to internal displacement. And they also run the displacement tracking matrix that you may have heard of, um, monitoring different types of displacement, but a, a majority of, uh, not majority, but, but a lot of it is internal displacement that they monitor. And then you have OCHA as a coordinating body, you've got UNDP, WFP, and all, and, and all of them in the mix, and through the cluster approach, and increasingly through now, through the uh, reformed UN system, through the RCs, the resident coordinators in country, where they're, you know, really su supposedly as now in the new system, to be the... Um, first point of call and also the kind of the, the converging, the convening uh, body and the main counterpart uh, and, and uh, of the UN vis-a-vis -vis the national government um, is going to play a, a bigger role. So the, I, I do think that the resident coordinator system and therefore the RCs themselves uh, will play a huge role for a cross-cutting topic like internal displacement. And then sadly, maybe we could I, I just end on that, on that question is um, that I, I think we had all hoped and I had certainly hoped that the COVID impacts and restrictions and everyone not being able to travel would have really given more water onto the mills of localization. I mean, we've all talked about the need to uh, move away from an expert based internationally driven kind of response and, and also you know, development agenda in, in these countries. Um, but it's not advanced as much as I would have hoped. I do fear that as soon as we can travel again, quite a lot of the actor and usual suspects will be there rather than building and investing in the capacity of local organizations, which be it government organizations or civil society, which I do think um, we, we really need to move towards. Otherwise, it's never going to really significantly improve. Thank you. All right, we have one more question in the chat, which works well with uh, the amount of time we have left. So one of our students is asking, uh, what predictions or projections do you have for the coming year or for 2022 in terms of internal displacement in different contexts around the world? Oh, and then I was un, uh, muted myself. Sorry, Alex, could you repeat that once more? There was a little bit of a break in my... No problem. Question. So the question is, what trends or predictions or projections do you have regarding internal displacement in different contexts around the world in the coming year? We try not to predict displacement and particularly not short term like this. So the, dis the risk models that I presented are really based on you know, very long term scenarios and, and um, probabilistic in a sense that they run through all scenarios and then you know, uh, assess the likelihood. I don't think we need to though predict uh, much to, and, and I see that I forgot my last slide to put it up, which was just a thank you slide, but had the banner of our upcoming global report, which I really wanted you to see actually, um, which we're publishing next uh, Thursday, which is why I couldn't yet uh, share the data. Um, and that has all the 2020 data. So um, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, in terms of predictions, it's probably relatively easy to predict which countries will still be in our report next year, uh, this year, but also next year and the year after uh, in terms of conflict displacement in particular. Also with disaster displacement, we've got, you know, the, con the hotspots are the Asia region um, in particular, the Pacific for conflict, it's sub so it's, it's, well, it's currently West Africa is particularly worrying in the Sahel region, Lake Chad region, but also Chad itself. Um, Mozambique, I mentioned, and it remains to be seen what happens now with the upcoming elections. Um, Middle East and North Africa remains, of course, a hot spot. Um, but we also have these long, these so-called, you know, frozen conflicts, uh, which aren't very frozen or quite active, as we have seen uh, in Central, in, in, in Eastern Europe and, and Central Asia. So where we've ha we've had a lot of uh, conflict flaring up again, and with with associated displacement. 
And then Central America, as I mentioned, I think earlier, um, of course, Colombia, but then Venezuela, um, Honduras, uh, El Salvador, etc. cetera. Um, and these are very, you know, complex displacement contexts. So we wouldn't, what we try not to do is just predict what number of people would be displaced next year, apart from, you know, within the context of the modeling. Um, but we know already, sadly, where the hotspots are. Hi, thank you so much, Dr. Desai. This was a great presentation. We are so glad that we were able to have you um, and that our audience got a chance to learn more about the IDMC. Uh, we will definitely look forward to your upcoming report and make sure that we share that out on our social. Um, but I wanna thank you guys for joining us today. Vasil, thank you for the introduction, Alex for moderating today, and then again, Dr. Desai for being with us. I hope you all have a wonderful day. There will be a video recording of this um, shared out to all of our registrants um, in the following days. So look for that. Um, and I hope you'll join us again for a Pearson Institute event. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.